want to encourage you this morning to uh, take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, th- this is a message, you, you, you always hope all messages are like this, but this is a message that uh, you would be wise. It would really help you if you took the notes that I'm going to give you. And it's easy because in the back of the little handout, there's uh, six little blanks. And, uh, and the reason for that is this, uh, sooner or later, you're going to need what Paul tells a young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1. You're going to need this. And uh, not only are you going to need it, but probably if you listen to people, uh, you'll discover there's other folks who'll need it. Well, I was a pastor. I had a church member. I had a few that did this. I had a church member. In fact, just dawned on me. Uh, he was the operator. He was the owner of the Chick-fil-A you work at, Gene Robertson. And about every week or two, he would say, Pastor, I hope you don't mind. I give you credit, but, but I always take notes every Sunday, and I talk to my leadership team once a week, and I, I give them the notes. And I'm like, mind? I wish every church member, I mean, share it as much. And I said uh, to Gene, I said, you don't even have to give me credit for it. Get the word out. Sooner or later, you're going to need this uh, for yourself. Sooner or later, you're going to come across someone who's going to need this. Uh, Paul is mentoring a young Timothy and uh, tells him something very important. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to read the first seven verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved son. I'm just going to pause. I'm not preaching on this. If you went back to 1 Timothy, Paul always gives a little greeting. We don't write this way. We, if you're a letter to me, you'd write, Dear Steve, and I don't, I don't see your name till the very end. Is that how you write a letter? They, they, they did it differently. But what's interesting is it's a different greeting. Uh, in, in 1 Timothy 1, uh, he talks about, To Timothy, my true child in the faith. But now he talks about my beloved child. You know why? Because at different stages of people's life, they need different words from you. Uh, Timothy is discouraged. Uh, Paul is in prison. It's the second Roman imprisonment. Nero is about to execute him. He's not going to leave uh, that dungeon alive. He's going to exit there and go to heaven. And so Timothy's a little discouraged. So Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now I'm sure it dwells in you as well. For this reason, here's why he's talking to him. I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and of self-control. Paul has been mentoring Timothy. In fact, if you're big in discipleship, you'll often hear this. Uh, every Timothy needs a Paul, and every Paul needs a Timothy. That's where the phrase comes from. In other words, uh, you always should be discipling somebody, and you should always have a mentor who is putting some things in your life, because none of us are perfect. We always want to grow. And, and Paul is writing what, what we know now would be his last uh, communication with Timothy, because he's going to be executed. Uh, and here's Timothy, who is a little bit uh, timid, a little bit discouraged. Now, now think about this. Uh, Sometimes we get discouraged over something small. Timothy's a little discouraged because his mentor, tradition tells us, is about to have his head coughed. That's how he's going to be executed. Also, Timothy's serving in a place where he he might run into someone and says, hey, how's how's Joe doing? Oh, they, they killed him two weeks ago. So you understand where Timothy's coming from. What's amazing is where Paul's coming from. Paul says you have no right to be discouraged. Paul says God 
didn't give you that spirit of fear. Now, the word fear there, understand what it means. Somebody says, well, I'm afraid of flying or I'm afraid of heights. That's not what that word means. It means cowardly. In other words, someone who has a job to do, but they're too much of a coward to do it. Uh, if we pulled up to a building that was burning and didn't go in, the news won't make a big deal about it. You let a fireman pull up and run the other direction, they're, they're a coward. Why? Because they are assigned a task. Uh, they have a job that they're supposed to do. And so Timothy is told by Paul, uh, it, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. A and can I tell you this? Paul had the right to say it, didn't he? Because Paul is in worse human trouble than Timothy's in. And he gives them an illustration. It's in verse 6. That is very vivid. It's a very vivid word picture. Uh, the New King James, which I preached out of quite a bit. This is an English standard version uh the king james says stir up the gift the word picture and this is fan the flame the word picture in the greek is a fire that's about to go out but there's still some hot coals in it and some of you will know what i'm talking about i don't know if you have ever had a fireplace anytime i read this passage i think about my mother my mother always had a wood burning stove and uh, we always seem to be because she lived so far away when, when I graduated seminary, she always seemed to be there for Thanksgiving and Christmas, or, or at least one of those. So there's always a wood burning, so there's always fire burning. And you, you get up in the morning, and, and you know anything about fire, you say, the fire's out. And it's, no, it's not. You, know, you may not see the fire, and I guess technically the fire may be out, but, but you don't need a match because you see those uh, hot coals in there, that, 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 that red and you could open that wood-burning stove, and you could get that little poker and do this, and the flame jumps up. And Paul uses that word picture. And he says, you need to fan the flame. You need to stir it up. Now, understand this. Timothy is preaching the gospel and being persecuted for it. Timothy is not missing church. Uh, Timothy is seeing people saved. But Paul says, you're not quite where you used to be. And so that's convicting, isn't it? In other words, if Paul says, I'm going to go visit Timothy, you know, he's been out of church for two years. That's not quite as convicting. Timothy is preaching the gospel. He is, he is in such a strategic position that Paul says, I pray for you daily. Now, let me tell you something about praying for folks. Somebody you pray for all the time. Now, I, I'm not talking about somebody like a relative or somebody wanting to get saved. But ju just a prayer you always pray, that's reserved for very few people. And Bill Graham was a lot. I prayed a lot for Bill Graham. Why? Because of the strategic importance. Uh, it's important to pray for presidents, right? Because why? Because it's not that I'm not important. It's just that they make decisions that really have a lot of impact. The reason Paul is praying for Timothy is not because he's apathetic. It's not because he's a nobody. It's because he's in a strategic position of advancing the gospel. But Paul's looking and saying, Timothy, you... You need to take that poker out. And you need, to, you need to stir that thing up. You need to fan the flame. Because although you're preaching and seeing people say it, and Timothy could have easily got defensive and said, what you talking about? Somebody got saved last week. But, 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 but your mentors who are spiritual always know. They can sense things. I, I'm still coming to worship. But if you need me five years ago, there was a time I worshiped where I... Do this more. You understand what I'm talking about? Paul, Paul, Paul was sensing something, and you better pray for some Pauls in your life. You better thank God if you've got folks who occasionally will take you out for a cup of coffee and have courageous conversations to take you from where you are to where God wants you to be. Most of us don't like that, by the way. See, when I talk to you about, about your preaching, well, you know, there's other preachers in Georgia. See, we like, we like to say there's other folks. You're not quite as excited. Well, you know, uh, there's other folks who are not excited. No, no. Timothy didn't place blame on anybody. Timothy undoubtedly received what God wanted him to receive. So I want to talk about, uh, I'm calling it, uh, how do you regain your passion? Uh, like, like I say in this, my translation, fan the flame, stir up the gift. And, and here's what's ironic. We, we, don't, we don't like to talk about stuff like this. It's just human nature. I like to talk about what do we need? Well, I don't need revival. I don't need anything. I, I need money. Because that means 
I need some folks who left the church to come back. See, it's, it's their fault. I need the community that sleeps in their bed every Sunday to get up out of bed and come to church. That's easy. I, I, need, I need Congress and senators to get their act together and, and, and stop that work you know, that they're doing and get back on the job. Get that budget right. And if you listen to people, that's what you'll hear a lot of times. Well, we're not growing like we need to be instantly. Well, well, my ministry's growing. Yeah, but that's just one ministry. We're talking about the whole church. It's not the same thing. And we need to stir up the gift that is within us. We, we need to have a passion. And the truth is, and this is, this is ironic. Now, I'm going to say it in a way, then I'll tell you where I got it from. Everything that I think I need is found in what Paul tells Timothy. I wish this church was more full. You have some passionate people, you have a full church. I wish the offerings were more. You get passionate people. If you don't believe me, let me quote Jesus. Seek first. What? Money. Mm -mm. Seek first to fill those seats. Mm -mm. Seek first prestige. Mm -mm. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, comma, and all these other things will be given to you. If you read that whole chapter, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount, what he's saying is, why do you worry? And why do you fear? It's very convicting. He says, you, you, you can't worry and add one height, one inch to your height, and so on. He, he gives some different examples there. He says, what you got to do is seek God and his kingdom. And what Paul is saying is, if you stir the flame, you know what happens? Everything else falls into place. It, it really does. If, if you stir the flame of God and there's a passion, you know what happens? Well, just about everywhere you go and you can't help someone. I said, man, you look happy today. Man, I should be happy. Man, I had an awesome worship at my church Sunday. Hey, you go to church anywhere? Now, that may not sound like much. You let 50, 60 people do that in Loganville, you know what happens? Makes an impact. Makes a tremendous impact. Let me give you an example. Uh, that's a spiritual thing. If this week, now we'd get arrested, but if this week you went out and every place you went, you, you, you broke out the window of the business, <laughs> would that make an impact in Loganville? Obviously would. It's the same thing. I, I go into Starbucks and I say something about Summit, and somebody says, man, there must be uh, 10 people this week have said something. That's what Paul's talking about. Paul is saying, Timothy, your problem ain't Nero which is hard for me to understand. Nero was a pretty rough guy. Your problem's not Nero. Uh, your problem's not the culture you live in. It's illegal to be doing what we're doing, and, and you may have to give your life. You may have to go to prison, or you may be executed. Timothy, you're, you know what your issue is? You. That's tough, isn't it? Your issue is you. And if you would stir up the gift of God and live with passion, there's nothing that God cannot do through your life. Uh, let, let me fill these blanks in first. Uh, what do you do when you lose your passion? How do you regain your passion? I put this down. A refilling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ephesians 5, Paul says, Be not drunk with wine, which very interesting choice of word. But what happens if you're drunk on anything? If somebody says, I took some cough medicine, or I took some sinus medicine, I feel like I'm drunk. It means you're under the control of another substance. Did you know that people who drank sometimes will do things when they're drinking that they wouldn't dare do any other time? <laughs> next week we're preaching on why you should abstain from alcohol, but that's, 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 that's next week. Uh, you, you can take someone who is shy, and they go to parties and drink, and, and they're the life of the party. Now, that's at least what that's, the deacons tell me that. I'm assuming they're telling the truth. <laughs> and, and, and Paul says, be controlled by the Spirit of God. So when you say, well, I'm just not that type of person, I get it. Because you ain't controlled by the Spirit of God. Ephesians 5 says, says be not drunk with wine, be, be filled with the Spirit. Paul's not saying you don't have the Spirit. Every Christian has the Spirit. Paul is saying you got the Spirit, but does the Spirit have you? That, that's different. Because when the Spirit has you, there's a lot of times where you may want to say no to start with. Go witness to your neighbor. Oh, man, that, that woman never smiles. I don't want to walk across that road and talk to her. 
but the Spirit of God prompts you. And so we're to be filled with the Spirit of God. I wrote this down. You must desire for God to control you. And, th- th- and that's, that's my problem. Sometimes we don't want God to control us. In other words, well, if God controls me, I'd have to get rid of my bitterness. Yeah, I ain't ready to. I enjoy being bitter against Jeff. I don't like, I don't like some of his music. I ain't ready to give that up yet. <laughs> well, if God controls me, would I have to go and apologize to that boss for that bad attitude? Yeah. I'm not ready to do that. I'm, I'm not ready to let go of that. Uh, you must ask him to control you, and then you must believe by faith that he's able. And so the quote, Paul, stir it up. Stir it up. That's what Paul's telling. Pa- Paul, Paul is getting, if you let the Spirit speak to you, he's talking to Timothy, but if he speaks to me, Paul's getting right in your face and saying, you know what you need? What? Stir it up. Stir it up. Fan the flame. Well, Paul, you don't understand. You don't live in Loganville. It's not really me. It's all these other people. Stir it up. Well, you don't understand. We, we, we had some pastors. That, Stir it up. You, 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 don't, you don't understand. And Paul's saying, no, you don't get it. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've got the greatest force living in you. You have a God who will supply anything you need to accomplish his will, and you don't need anything else besides God. That, that's what he's saying. Second thing is this, remember when the passion or flame of your life burned the brightest. I have people say this to me all the time. Boy, there was a time I was just on fire. There was a time I was, well, what were you doing? Well, I was back when I used to witness all the time. This is why you don't have to be super intelligent to do what I'm doing. So you're saying when you used to share Jesus everywhere, your flame burned bright. Yeah. Well, my advice is I'd start sharing Jesus again. Uh, there was a time I, I served in the choir and I was so excited. I, I, when did you get out of the choir? Three years ago. Take a note. You may want to get back in the choir if that's what God's called you to do. Oh, you, you just fill the blank in. Whatever you were doing, when your flame burned the brightest, I would go back and start doing it again. Uh, somebody says, oh, I know what you're talking about. Well, there was a time I used to teach men's Bible studies. And I, there, was, there, there was a time I used to be a Sunday school teacher. Man, there was a time when I served as deacon. This isn't hard. That's why Paul, Paul said in Corinthians, to guys like me, look at your calling. There's not many. He didn't say there weren't any, but there's not many noble, not many wise, not, not many of high birth. What he's saying is, basically God calls nobodies. Now, Paul was not in that category. Paul, Paul was a, uh, renaissance time, man. He knew about eight, ten different languages. But most of us, that's not who we are. You know why you don't have to be that way? Because it's not hard. Well, I, I, I remember it's fun coming to church. I just shout. Okay, take some notes. Get back to shouting. Because sometimes the joy doesn't come before you obey. Did you know that? Uh, sometimes obedience is what brings the blessings. In fact, normally that's what happens. God, if you'll give me the joy, I'll shout. No, God says, you do some shouting, you'll get the joy. A third thing, refocus your attention on God. If you read the Bible a lot, the Bible, and by the way, some people don't, because sometimes I'll talk about we ought to meditate, and every once in a while somebody come to me, oh, well, is, that, is that some kind of Eastern religion? No, the Bible talks about meditating. So if you read the Bible, you'll see it, for example, uh, Joshua chapter 1, Joshua has a tremendous assignment. That's an understatement. Moses has just died. You're going to be the guy now. Now, I'm going to tell you, I have occasionally been in situations where I felt like way over my head. But when you're the dude who about to replace Moses, I understand why you may have a little bit of timidity about what you're about to do because he's led so well for so long. And God says, What? That the book of the law should not depart, but meditate in it day and night. But do you know this? We all meditate. I've been here about eight months. Some of you meditate good. You know what you meditate on? You, you meditate on the former pastor and everything you don't like. <laughs> Every Sunday you leave and say, I, I counted this many empty seats. You're, 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 you're meditating. The only problem is you're meditating on the wrong thing. You, and what, by the way, when you do that, what happens? Do, do you ever meditate on negative things and feel better? I don't impossible to 
Or you can meditate on God. For example, Isaiah 26, 3, God says, I'll keep you in perfect peace. Folks who set their mind to be steadfast on me. And it's true. There, there, there's something about meditating on God. And so we refocus. And that's what Paul's doing to Timothy. Paul's stepping in saying, Timothy, you're doing something wrong here. You, you're, you're looking at me being in prison. Forget about it. You're, you're looking at hardships. Forget it. There's a job to be done. There's a task to accomplish. And so whenever we begin to lose our passion, refocus on God. Just begin to think about all that God has for us. Now, the initial focusing is not going to be fun. Because it's a whole lot more fun to say, let me tell you what's wrong with the church. There's five things. Of course, none of those things are me. I mean, that's, I'm going to tell, tell you whose fault it is. What's hard is when you meditate on God and he takes the sword of the Spirit and he performs surgery on you. In the awesome God series, Isaiah 6, on holy. If you were here for that message, Isaiah was the Billy Graham of his day. Isaiah didn't go to the temple. He, he didn't say, hey, I'm going to go to the temple today because I, I feel like I need my, I need, I need revival. No, he went to pray for the, he's, man, the nation's going to hell in a handbasket. But when he saw Jesus high and exalted, he, all of a sudden he said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And, and I missed that when I was young and in college. Uh, just a casual reading of that, I thought what he meant was he must have been somebody who occasionally gossiped or told some dirty jokes. What he meant was this. Wow. I thought I had been preaching. He'd been preaching all over Israel. He's famous. He said, but in light of seeing Jesus exalted, I've done nothing. And you refocus on what God wants you to focus on. And that's, that's him. Uh, fourth thing is this. You reject the lies of Satan. It's one reason I don't get discouraged too often. There's two reasons I don't get discouraged too often. One is, is I've learned when discouragement comes, and my mind works different than probably yours does, I can tell, you start to be able to do this, when I was 20, 21, I'd get discouraged for a while. I can tell when discouragement's coming my way. Can, can you do that? I can. In, in other words, it's almost, like, it's almost like, and this is how my mind works, it's almost like discouragement has jumped on my britches leg. I can sense it. Sometimes somebody will say something, and it's almost like God whispers, be careful, because they just spoke a word that's not a faith. And I've got, in fact, this is probably embarrassing, but some of you probably say the same thing. If you paid me today, I could not tell you. I have no idea how many Bibles I have in my office at home. I don't, I don't, I have, I've got them everywhere. So I just take Bibles. And, and, and I'll, I'll take a word. And if discouragement comes, especially my office by myself, I'll say, no, not on me. And I'll begin to quote a verse. I'll begin to pray through a verse. Uh, I, I'll begin to lift up a verse. And, and so what you're doing is you're rejecting the lies of the devil. Oh, devil come up and say, some it won't ever grow again. Now, did God tell you? I've heard some of you say that. Did God tell you that, the, uh, who, uh, that of your own making? Well, I'm not sure God told me. Let me be very plain. I shut my mouth and I would never speak a word from God that's not of God. Amen. It's one of, the, one of the greatest sins in Scripture. If you add to the Word, boy, there's a great punishment. Or you take away from the Word. I don't have an option. I can't tell you I, that, that I don't believe in hell. I can't tell you I can't believe in heaven. Uh, all I can tell you is here's what God says. I believe what He says. Here's what He says. And we better go by what He says. So I, I'm very cautious to such an extent that occasionally I'll meet with a young pastor. He'll say something audacious. Just, and I may flippantly say something. I'll call him the next day and say, brother, I owe you an apology. Now, when you're 55 and call a 25-year-old and say, I spoke a word that the more I think about it, I'm not sure what I spoke was of God. Or sometimes to say, what I spoke wasn't of God. You know what that does for you, though? Once you have to humble yourself and do that, you get very cautious about speaking anything. So somebody says, God called me to go to China by faith, no support. You know what I say? Well, God's in it. Just make sure, here, here's some signs of God being, peace that passes understanding, lines up with Scripture, talk to me about your marriage, talk to me about your, and, and so on and so on. What are you doing in the church you currently serve? For example, somebody tells me, God's calling to go to China to witness. Uh, who have you witnessed to lately in Georgia? Nobody. Red flag. If I could just get people to support me, uh, you, you, you tithe or give? No, I never have. Red flag. And, 
and so I say that to say you reject the lies of Satan. Uh, I'll just plant something here before I tell you how you do this. If you read the story of David and Goliath, I mean the whole thing. In 1 Samuel 17, it's a long chapter. You'll see him doing that. You know why? Because he doesn't just say, I'm going to fight Goliath. And everybody says, brothers say, woo, go for it. Army of Israel, woo, do it. King Saul, oh, we're glad somebody's going to do it. Everybody who's around him tried to talk him out of doing what God wanted him to do. Well, how, how did he do it? If you read that whole chapter, you'll find that every time they tried to talk him out of it, he quoted something about his history with God. Oh, God can take care of Goliath. How do you know that? Because one time a wolf came up, and God took care of the wolf. One time a, a, a bear came up, and God took care of the bear. And he believed that God could do what only God could do, to such an extent that when he finally saw Goliath, what did he say? He said, this is interesting. And remember, Goliath's words to him was not encouraging. Goliath was offended. Goliath said, I can't believe this. I've been calling for, for, for a long time that Israel would sound the best man. And then he said, do you think I'm a dog? You mean you're the runt they sent out? And David says, listen, you've got all this protection and swords and all this armor. I've come out to you in the name of the Lord my God. And in that chapter, he says something you find in other places in the Bible. He says that the battle isn't his, the battle is God's. That, that's a major victory. Anytime I think the battle is mine, what happens? I get a weight on me. You, you ever read the verse? It, in fact, it's in the Old and New Testament. Cast your burden before the Lord. That's the word picture. Man, I'll tell you, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Or I'm, well, I ain't going to do anything. But follow God. Jesus said, unless Steve Foster builds a church. No, he didn't say that. Unless the deacons of Summit build the church. No, unless I build the church. He's going to build the church. And what happens when he builds the church? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church that Jesus is building. So my job is just to seek him. So how do we reject the lies of Satan? A few things. Recall past victories. I, I'm not saying there's that many great things about getting old. There are some good things. Uh, most of us would rather be 25 than probably 75. That's just the way life seems to be with a lot of people. But I'll tell you one good thing about growing older. If you have a walk with God, you've got some victories. We say this in Texas. This ain't my first rodeo. So I need to talk to you. I'm mad. Get in line. I may have worked when I was 19. I'm 55. People mad at me all across America. I'm not worried about that. It might make me any difference. Well, well let me try to convince you why God can't do what he wants to do. Man, you done got to me too late. The devil tried that when I first got saved. I, I, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe that God can do everything he says he can do in this word. And if I ever get where I don't believe that, I hope I would have the integrity to throw this thing away and never step foot back in a church. And if you know the Bible, you'd agree with that. Why? Jesus said, I'd rather you be what? Lukewarm? Well, he says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. And, and so we reject the lies excuse me, we recall past victories, and by doing that, it helps us to reject the lies of the devil. In other words, uh, you, you begin to think about, you know, there was a time you needed money for this. When was that, 20 years ago? Did you get the money? Yeah. Remember that time you, you stepped up by faith to go to college on, on a work in God, and the devil told you you're going to starve? He lied because you gained 20 pounds while you are in college. <laughs> I remember when, when we went to seminary, we, we had enough money, moved from Texas to New Orleans, for two weeks of groceries. I, I don't know. It's probably greater than this. I bet I gained 50 pounds in seminary, didn't I? I got in. Some of the time, Deidre said amen since I've been here. <laughs> I, got, I got to New Orleans with all that seafood. But, I, but I'm telling you, there's a few times, Don, and, and going to New Orleans, I was like, man, I hope I don't starve to death. And I had to get back in the Word. I had to get back in the Word. But you know what I've discovered? The devil lies. In fact, that's an understatement. Jesus said, he not only lies, he's the father of lies. And so we, we reject the lies of Satan, but recall past victories, and then we re-examine and re reaffirm our motives. You always have to do this. For example, I'll meet with a young pastor, and I'm going to start a new church, and I'm going to be famous. Might want to pray about that. I don't think you start a church to be famous. I think you start it to make the name of Jesus famous. Yeah. I don't think we're going to exalt you. 
I think we're supposed to exalt Jesus. And so you're always reaffirming your motives. For example, if I have a pastor here, and I said, well, reach some people won't be able to pay bills. Fold it up, man. Because if the only reason we want to reach people is to pay bills. But here, but here again, is the ironic thing about it. If you do what God wants you to do, he takes care of the rest anyway. But why do we want to reach people? Because there's a hell. Well, why do you want your neighbor to be saved? Because he, I want him to go to heaven. Well, what, why do you want the neighbor to be a man or woman of God? Because those children in the house deserve to be in a house that's spirit-filled. In other words, if my motive is, well, I wish my neighbor gets saved. He wakes me up 2 o'clock every Friday night. He's so drunk. Well, she gets saved so he won't wake me up. That's a very poor motive. The motive always has to be what brings glory and honor to God. And so we reaffirm our motive, and then we reject all the discouraging words that people and the devil tell us. And don't shake your head. You ever hear any discouraging words around here? You, you, you ever go, I have people will tell me they see somebody in a restaurant. Somebody, and it's funny about people, most folks won't tell you positive things. You ever notice that? Hardly ever somebody come up and say, you know, I just believe God's going to use you so much. But they don't mind coming up saying, man, you're going to starve to death if you try to be a missionary. You, you know, uh, you, 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 you think you're going to reach people? That, that youth group never be as big as it was. You know, what verse is that? Where, where do you get that from? But the reason this is so important is because isn't it human nature? It is human nature. If you hear 99 positive things but one negative thing, it's human nature to leave and say, yeah. Jamie, this will happen in preaching sometimes. You'll, especially in churches where you preach and there's a one exit and you stand back and shake. 100 people will be there, 99 people. That's the best Bible. God bless one person. I didn't get nothing out of it. You'll go home. Well, nobody got nothing out of it today. How's that? Well, one person. How many was there? A hundred. What the other nine? I say, said, said they've been revived. Said God came down. And so you have to reject the lies of Satan and reject those discouraging words. The fifth thing is this. Retreat and renew your intimate relationship with God. Retreat and renew your intimate relationship with God. Now, this time of the year, and we don't do it throughout the year, but this time of the year, usually just starting about the first of November, the end of October, I always begin to look towards 2000, whatever it was, in this case, 2019. I always begin to look towards the next year. Uh, done it so often, there's four or five things I look at. My spiritual life, I look at my financial life, I look at my vocational life, I look at my physical life, I, I look at my, my home life. I, I, I look at those things, and I begin to set some goals. And quite frankly, I don't always reach every goal. What I've discovered is, if I have some goals... I normally accomplish more than if I didn't have any kind of goals. And so I'm always looking, what is it God wants me to do? What, what, what is it spiritual? I need to read through the Bible. Is there some verse I need to memorize? Is there something I was weak on that I not witnessed very much? I, I'm always looking, and I take a pause. And, and I let God set the direction for my life. And what I find is the more I read and the more I know about the nature of God, I'm not shocked when negative words come. I'm not shocked when opposition rises. In fact, it's, it, it's kind of hard to be shocked when Paul makes this statement. Yeah, and all those who live godly shall suffer persecution. Well, you know, if that is the true statement, it is, then obviously I won't be the exception. If people did not like the ministry of Jesus, everybody's not going to like the ministry of Summit. If people did not like the ministry of Jesus, everybody's not going to like your ministry as a deacon or pastor or Sunday school teacher a church member, a husband, a wife, and so on. You have to do what God wants you to do. But retreat and renew your intimate relationship with God. And, and here's what you want to hear. I, I, I love being around people like this. You get to listen to them. And they'll, say, they'll make statements like this. Pastor, let me tell you what God's been sharing with me in my devotion time. Oh, man, I love that. What I really love is when this person over here is saying something and they don't even really know this person over here very well. They say something on Sunday and on Tuesday someone over here says about the same thing and I'm like, and y'all don't know it, God told me the same thing a week ago and all of a sudden there's some confirmations about what God's doing. But if you don't have the intimate walk with God, you know what you do? Your whole life. James says we're blown about by every wind of doctrine. If I don't have that kind of a walk with God, what happens is, is I 
say, well, I don't think this is going to work. I don't think we'll ever do I don't think we'll ever baptize people. I don't think we'll ever do this. But the person has an intimate walk with God before it even happens. They will tell you, God has been leading me in this direction. God has been showing me some things. God has been uh, prompting my heart to prepare for this because he's got something he's wanting me to do and you begin to obey God. So retreat and renew your intimate relationship with God. I put this down. A desire to know his presence. If you read Bible tomorrow, why do you read it? If someone says, oh, well, because 20 years ago somebody decided to read the Bible every day. Well, what did you read this morning? I already forgot about it. Yeah. You have to have this desire to know the presence of Jesus. And you have to be honest enough to say, Lord, show me. Even things I don't want to even the ugliness on the inside, show me that I might be a better instrument, that I might be more like Jesus that I might impact more people. Whatever you need to do to make me more useful to your kingdom, then, Lord, you do that. And by the way, those are dangerous prayers, aren't they? Because the problem is he answers prayers. Because you pray those prayers sometimes, and all of a sudden you lose your job. And God says, congratulations, that's it. This is your opportunity for faith. Oh, well, that's really what I had in mind. Lord, whatever you need to do, do it, that I might look more like Jesus. By the way, if you have one ounce of spirituality in you, the people who live those kind of lives, when you go through trouble, those are the folks you're trying to meet with. Hey, can I meet with you? Why? Because you understand they've got some scars. Paul says, I bury my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Those were physical marks from persecution. But you see some spiritual scars. Man, I'm, I, I need to meet with that man. Why? <laughs> He's walked this way a long time. He, know, he knows every pothole. He knows every little uh, dangerous curve. He, he, he knows what lies beyond that dark tunnel I'm about to walk through. I must believe that you can experience this presence. You need to spend time with God, and you must not ever allow unconfessed sin to live in your life. Just what, what, whatever God points out to you, keep short accounts. Just, hey, I'm wrong. Hey, I was wrong with this. I said this. I did this. And I'm moving on, and I'm, I'm going to be all God wants me to be. Last thing is this. Return to your work fully committed and determine to live for Jesus. Uh, let, let me say something if you took notes. I, I've said this about a couple messages. It's rare, but it's true of this message. If you take notes, we have to talk this way because it's how we, how we talk, you know, one, two, three. That's not necessarily how God works. This is not really a one, two, three like it's on your paper. That's how we had to do it. It's more like this, one, two, three, four. Sometimes when I stir it up, sometimes I don't go to number one. Sometimes I... I, I I need to retreat with God. Sometimes when I need to stir up the flame, fan the flame, sometimes I need to reject discouraging words because there's different times I'm at different places of my walk with God. But I will tell you this, I believe the person like Timothy who makes a difference in the kingdom, they're always somewhere on this cycle. They're always doing something. Let me, let me conclude and say this. A few years ago, I was preaching somewhere in South Georgia. I don't remember where now. Uh, but I went during the day to meet with a group of pastors. It, it wasn't a big meeting. It was just maybe 25, 30 pastors. I don't remember what I talked about. I preached on something. But it was one of those services where when it was over with, the director of missions got up and said something, and all of a sudden, y'all been in services like this, a little revival began to break. You begin to hear some people weeping. And In fact, it's interesting. I was doing something, what we think of big that week, the blessing was not in the big. The blessing was in that little, little meeting. And different people said things. And there was a young pastor that was growing a church. In fact, everybody's talking about it. And he said something I'll never forget. I wrote down my journal. I, I wouldn't forget it anyway because it was such an unusual thing to say. He said this. He got up and said, brothers. And he began to weep. I mean, like he was shaken pray for me ironically one of the largest I mean he was growing a church God was using that young man he said pray for me I'm hot for Jesus and I'm going to quote him bad grammar here's what he said I'm hot for Jesus but I ain't on fire and all of a sudden men begin to weep 
I know what he meant. He, he meant what Paul was telling Timothy. He's he growing a church. He, he's not saying, I'm a liberal. I don't preach. Oh, he, he was preaching the word. He was witnessing. What he meant was, there's a lot of good things I'm doing. And, and I feel the heat of serving. I feel the heat of Jesus. But there was a time, there was a time when I was on fire. There was a time where it wasn't just, just hot coals. There was a time when I was ablaze for God. I want it. And he ended up, just, just took 30 seconds, he ended up again by saying, pray. Pray for me. And I thought this all week. If we ever reach a stage at Summit where we look back to where we used to be, I don't mean, I'm not talking about building, I'm talking about here. And people who had an excitement, I mean, no offense, I, I go to Carol's office all the time. That, that, ain't, that ain't really much, I mean, it ain't much over there. That was y'all's church building. And Loganville was growing. And somehow a passion for Jesus convinced people, many who were moving here, buying new homes, they had no more sense than to join a church that met in a trailer. Why? Because when you stir up the flame and the flame burns bright, vision does more than money. Vision does more than location. Vision does more than chandeliers. There's something about vision that's of God that not only consumes you, but the fire draws other people. When every head bowed, every eyes closed. We're going to have a time of invitation. I, I, I've prayed something all week. I'll share it with you. What I've prayed is, Lord, Sometime in 2019, a new pastor's coming. And I know y'all are praying for that. Lord, I pray he'd find a church filled with passionate, on-fire people. Because I'm convinced, I believe it's all in my heart. A church at this location full of passionate, on-fire people, you can't help but grow one day. There's too much opportunity. But you know, I've said this before here, Often God wants to do a work in us before he does a work through us. I'd much rather he do a work through me because the work in me is spiritual surgery. The work in me means I have to face up to some things I might be doing that's not good. The work in me sometimes means I have to confess there's things I ought to be doing that I'm not doing. And sometimes when you're serving, whether it's my role or Sunday school teacher or deacon or, or team member or like Timothy, sometimes it's not easy to have to admit, you know, my biggest problem is I need to fan the flame that used to burn so brightly in my life. I've let, I've let it die down. It's just, it's just hot coals now. It's not what it used to be. Father God, we give you this invitation time. Lord, just so convinced. I'm, I'm convinced.